Good morning. morning. Welcome to Cedar Creek Bible Church. If you haven't noticed, today is a mission-themed Sunday with the Curtises here, but I don't want to steal Al's thunder. He's going to introduce them later. I'll invite you to join me in standing. We're going to do our scripture reading. You'll find that on the back of your bulletin. Hopefully you received one this morning. From Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 27. We'll read this responsively. If you can tell the difference between the black and the green print, you're going to read the green print, and I'll read the black print. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. God, who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. You may be seated. Thank you. I will. 
Thank you, choir. I'll invite you to join me now, hymn number 277, 277, the church's one foundation. I'll invite you to stand with me, if you would, as we sing together, 277, the church's one foundation. Thank you. It is a joy for us to be together on this Missions Sunday. Thank you for joining us. I trust that the Lord will minister to your heart through the, the worship and the words, the teaching, the instruction that we'll be receiving throughout the day. Um, you're here this morning, you're welcome to come back tonight because we're going to be able to receive more, uh, Lord willing, and we're certainly looking forward to that as well as what the Lord has for us together this morning. Just a couple announcements to be aware of this morning. The adult Sunday school class, because you had a special Sunday school class this morning, is going to be meeting this Tuesday at 6.30 in the evening. So that's a little bit unusual, but we've gotten used to doing that to make up for the Sunday school opportunities that we miss when we have special days like this. So if you're part of the adult Sunday school class, then I certainly would invite you to join them at the church at 6.30 this Tuesday. There will be an afterglow after the evening service tonight, so if you need just a little bit of extra motivation to come on out, then maybe that will do it for you. It certainly is good for us to have the Curtises with us here today. We're looking forward to your ministry with us the rest of this day. Several things that we have to be praying for this morning. Uh, many of you are aware by now that Paul Sweetland passed away unexpectedly this week. And so we certainly are praying for his wife, Anne, for his family. 
Um, there are still arrangements that are being made for the funeral, so we don't know exactly what to anticipate for that, but we certainly will let you know as a congregation when we have that information. Pastor Norton's father passed away this week as well. Many of you have been praying for him. Thank you for that. Do continue to be in prayer for the family as they mourn his passing. There's not going to be any immediate funeral uh, arrangement for that, but do continue to be in prayer for the family in light of his passing. And then Doreen Stanton's father-in-law passed away this week as well. Of course, we were praying for the Stanton family uh, just about a month ago. Um, with the passing of her mother-in-law. So this was not necessarily entirely expected, uh, but we know that God has a plan and that he was in control of that. So let's be in prayer this morning for all three of those families that are mourning, um, but also rejoicing at the Lord's goodness and the promise that we have of an eternal home in heaven with the Lord. So there is, there is joy in the midst of our sorrow, even as we remember these families in their time of grief this morning. I'll be praying for our offering this morning. We are, of course, continuing to give for our missions project that we've been doing for the last several weeks. This, of course, will be our last opportunity to do that. Um, and then I'll be praying for the remainder of our time together this morning. And I'll invite you to join with me as we go together before the Lord in prayer at this time. Our Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy to us as your children. We thank you for the joy of your presence with us as we go through life, there are many challenges that we struggle with from day to day. Sometimes it feels like the burdens become extra heavy, and we certainly feel that for those families in our congregation that are grieving today. And Father, we pray that you would minister to them in a very deep and powerful way, that they might know the presence and the, and the working of your Holy Spirit in their hearts, ministering grace and comfort and peace. We pray in each of these situations that um, there would be opportunity for the gospel to go forth, that those who have heard it before but who have rejected that gospel message or who have walked away from it might be graciously drawn back by your sovereign hand to understand their need for Christ and to accept him as their savior. We pray that you would be glorified in uh, the services that will be taking place. We pray that uh, your word would go forth with clarity and with power and that you would sustain those who are, who are grieving at this time because of this loss. We pray that you'd help us to come together as a church family as we have opportunity that we might minister comfort and encouragement to one another. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to observe a missions Sunday today. Lord, of course, we realize that missions is not a theme that only concerns us one day out of the year, but it is truly the great mission that you have given us to be accomplishing in this earth. And every single one of us has an important role to serve in the accomplishment of that mission. We thank you for the encouragement and for the conviction that we've already felt uh, from the ministry that we've received from the Curtises in Sunday school this morning. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work, that you might empower them, that you might use their words and their testimony um, and their service for you to inspire us to be faithful in the callings that you have given each of us. We pray that you would strengthen their hands for the work that you have given them, that you would strengthen their hearts and that you would give them uh, great fulfillment in the ministry that they are carrying out. We pray that you would give them great success, that they would see your spirit working, changing hearts, changing minds, and we pray that you would give them a fruitful harvest in the years to come as they continue to serve you on the field that you have called them to in the DRC. We thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to give you our financial offerings. We recognize that it is um, not enough for us to repay all that you have given to us, but it is a privilege, it is a joy for us to be able to give in token of the fact that we belong to you entirely. And we pray that you would help us to give in light of that realization this morning. We ask that you would empower the remainder of our worship. We pray that you would accomplish the work in our midst that you desire to during the remainder of this service. May Christ be honored and glorified in all that takes place in it. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
It's your turn to join me once again. This hem will be on an insert in your bulletin. You'll also find it on the screen behind me. Beneath the cross. And I'll invite you to join me in standing, please. seated. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Well, once again, I come up to uh, introduce the Curtises to you. Uh, we had the privilege of listening to them during Sunday school. And uh, just a few quick things. I have to refer to Seth now as not as our missionary because he is a pastor. So he is pastor, see, Seth. He's a pastor at New Life Church. He is a father. He's a husband. He's our missionary. And then there's Darla. Darla is wife, a mother, and a teacher. She's a homeschool teacher, and she is our missionary. Both of them serve at the, in the, the Congo. This is also home where Darla grew up. So as they come here in just a minute, uh, as Seth comes to share the word with us, as uh, he was sharing with us earlier there in Sunday school, also noticed he talked about this Congo coalition. And that sounded real familiar to me because our pastors are members of a pastor's fellowship, which serves in, I think it's a tri-county area or, or two counties, members, other pastors from other churches join together in similar uh, situations. So this morning, we're privileged to have with us our missionaries, Pastor Seth Curtis. Would you come, please?
Well, good morning. It was good to share with you all this morning in the Sunday school period, just a little bit of an update on uh, how God is working to build his church and the privilege that we have had to be a part of the, the local congregation there in Lubumbashi. I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles this morning to Acts 17, and I'd like to use the time that we have this morning, and I was laughing I'll take as much as they'll give me because I don't preach for 30 minutes or 35 minutes ever, 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 ever. But uh, I will try to stick to my notes. That's why I was laughing when my iPad stopped working during the Sunday school period. I don't need to have my notes. I just can tend to stay within the time that I'm allotted if I stick to my notes. Um, But this morning, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the truths of God's word regarding the the character of God as well as the way that God functions within his own economy that he created. Truths that have been an incredible blessing uh, and and even a sustenance to our church in Congo over the course of these past months, um, starting from COVID through to where we find ourselves today. And I'm going to kind of break this up between this morning and also this evening, if, you, if you'll be willing to come back this evening and pick up where we left off. So we're gonna, I'd like to direct your minds and your attention to Acts chapter 17, where Paul had the opportunity to tell the Athenians about the unknown God. And uh, our story picks up shortly after Paul had been uh, in the city of Berea. And so for some context, let's read, uh, <clears throat> starting in verse 11 picks up here that, uh, and again, I guess I should mention, I, I'll be reading out of the, the New Living Translation. That is what I'm used to in Congo. If, if you have trouble, sometimes if it's not matching up exactly, uh, just listen maybe and go back through and study some of those uh, on your own time afterwards, but just take note of the passages. Uh, it says in verse 17, the people of Berea listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. And verse 12 says, as a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. And so then by the time we arrive at verse 18, Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him in Athens. And verse verse 16 says that Paul was deeply troubled. What was troubling him? He was troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Verse 17 says, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. Well, shortly after this, the people of Berea brought Paul before their council where Paul addressed them, and then he had some things to say here in verse 22. He said, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. And Paul said this to them, this God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. The Athenians had a lot of gods. They feared them, they served them, they were concerned that their might have been one that they missed. <laughs> and their, even in their attempts to know them all, they were not sure that they knew them all. And it's very interesting that many of the people that we minister to in Congo are very much akin to the Athenians in that they think they know who God is, but they have missed him. Uh, and when we minister within the culture of Central Africa, As I describe it to you here this morning, it may seem like we have a little bit of an advanced starting point for sharing the gospel because most Congolese that you talk to uh, believe that there is one all-powerful God who created the universe and put everything into motion. And you would say, wow, that would be neat to live in a culture like that. What an opportunity to everyone you talk to believed that right? Um, In fact, though, the view of God that I just described to you is a basic tenet 
of African traditional religion. It has nothing to do with the Bible at all. Uh, ATR, or African traditional religion, is the worldview that most people that we encounter in Central Africa and even into other parts of Africa, it is the worldview that they prescribe to. There's no written scriptures of ATR. Everything is orally handed down from grandmother to grandson, from father to daughter. Um, And uh, you would understand Everywhere that you go, you maybe can go to a completely new location, and, and yet, if you understand the basic tenets of African traditional religion, now you have a window into the hearts of those people there, and a fairly good starting point to understand how they're thinking and how they're processing. Um, so ATR is the way that the people in the region we minister to see the world. It's as if they have, I told, the, uh, I told you all in Sunday school this morning, it's as if they have a, f- a pair of tinted glasses on, maybe rose tinted, and everything they look at is rose. They're, everything they look at is filtered through the, the worldview of African traditional religion. And I think you would agree with me that this seems like it should be a fairly advanced starting point to sharing the gospel, to consider there is one creator God. Technically, it's a, a monotheistic culture in, with a, a creation narrative. And yet, um, it isn't easier for us to minister in Congo. The truth is where we minister, uh, yes, we don't have to Um, argue against the mindsets of atheism or agnosticism or polytheism, but the commonalities between ATR and a biblical worldview of God and creation unfortunately end there. Let me share with you just a little bit of what uh, ATR uh, teaches um, and how the average Congolese views the world around them. Um, So I already mentioned that the Congolese believes that there is a a creator God. The predominant understanding of the world around us is that God created the world and he placed man at its center. Uh, And that creator God of ATR also created the spirit realm and he surrounded man with the many occupants of the spirit realm to serve him. And then he caused plants and animals and geographic features within the physical realm uh, to be connection points between man and the spirit realm, that there would be points of access between those two realms with those geographical features. So you could have a mountaintop has great significance within uh, African culture, that you go to the mountaintop to access the spirit realm, right? There can be trees and certain geological features like boulders and rocks that have connection points. Uh, It is understood between the spirit realm and the physical realm so that man, and God placed those there, it is understood, so that man could have access to communicate with the spirit realm through those means. And then it is understood that the God of ATR created power. And uh, power is not, it's not moral in any way, it's just there. I should maybe also clarify that even the inhabitants of the spirit realm it is not understood that they are good or bad. They are just there. Uh, there's no uh, a biblical understanding of evil spirits or, or angels. Uh, it is just spirits. And maybe the spirit that is helping you, <laughs> he's good because he's helping you. But that same spirit could be doing something against your neighbor and your neighbor thinks he's bad, right? Um, so God, the God of ATR, it is understood he created power and the occupants of the spirit realm are understood to have differing levels of access to that power. So you can have powerful spirits or less powerful spirits. And then it is also believed that great and special men here on this earth also have access to that power. It's interestingly, uh, ATR understands that the creator God of the universe created the physical realm. He created the spiritual realm. He created power, but then um, he left. He left. 
Many Africans believe and live their lives as if the creator God is very far away. It's not, he's not checking in on his creation. The creation was an act that he accomplished, and now he is far away. Perhaps he's also a solitary being. We don't know. There's no scripture that would teach us about him. Uh, we just heuristically know or pragmatically know that he, is, he likes his privacy, perhaps, because we don't see him. We don't see him at work It's not understood that he is involved in anything. Everything that is understood to be happening is happening by the inhabitants of the spirit realm that God created. Perhaps God is very different from us. It is understood that perhaps we would not be able to even know him even if we had the opportunity. So the African mind is not that concerned with knowing God or being connected to him in any way. But at the same time, they embrace all of the entities that populate the spirit realm as their gods, right? And I can say that those spirit entities represent the culmination of their fears and of their hopes, right? Just like, um, just like the many gods that the Athenians uh, were worshiping and within their very religious culture, the Congolese are very much like that. Uh, even though they would, they would technically, right, understand there to be one God, they view the inhabitants of the spirit realm as their many gods. Well, when Paul had a chance to address the Athenians in Acts 17, it's interesting that he had quite a bit to say to today's average Congolese as well. Paul said this in reference to the unknown God that the Athenians were worshiping in verse 24 of Acts 17. He said, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. And then he went on in verse 27 to say, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps fill their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. There are many churches in Congo, but sadly, the tenets of ATR are a foundational way for many of them to continue to view the world around them, even sadly, within the church. Uh, in the church, that what we often find is a, is a re-labeling or a re-understanding of ATR concepts with using Christian labels to describe those things. So maybe I could give an example of the occupants of the spirit realm are then now understood to be angels and demons, right? Um, the, uh, the idea of power that God created becomes synonymous with the Holy Spirit, perhaps. Pastors and teachers become the men of power who have connecting points between uh, the spirit realm and the physical realm. And then, unfortunately, within this relabeling, God is still viewed as far away. And the misconception of ATR, those misunderstandings, those twistings of what really is true in God's creation are forced upon the scriptures, creating many, many conflicts for churchgoers in Africa. Eventually, uh, uh, it is, we understand they, they have the Bible, God's very word, right? If they will study it, if they will read it, um, But even though they have the Bible, they impose upon it the worldview of ATR and they understand it through the pre-understood ideas of African traditional religion. Essentially, what is happening is they are empowering the God of this world to interpret 
the scriptures for them. That's a big problem, isn't it? Um, and who does the Bible identify as the God of this world? It's Satan, isn't it? Small g, right? The God of this world is Satan. The Apostle Paul wrote about that very dynamic in 2 Corinthians 4, where he said, if you want to write down 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 to look at later, he says this in verse 3, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. The second thing that Satan does to hinder the Congolese access to God's truth, even though they hold it in their hands, is that Satan works to decrease the importance of the written word of God. I'll explain Uh, African traditional religion has an emphasis upon revelation. It does. We deal with it constantly. Um, Specifically, there is a great desire to know what will happen tomorrow (laughs) or to have foreknowledge of the path that must be taken. And uh, guidance from the spirit realm within the worldview of ATR takes on various forms. It can come in the form of direct communication with the inhabitants of the spirit realm, like a spirit guide, right? So it is understood that God created the spirits that inhabit the spirit realm. It, but all of those an, of your ancestors who have gone on before you, when they die, they also, as understood, go into the spirit realm and inhabit the spirit realm. And so uh, it can, there can be direct communication from a deceased ancestor that you are in contact with. ATR, and I could go into storytelling mode right now and just stretch this out late beyond lunch if you like. But um, there are fascinating stories of members of our church who have come out of this worldview and have all of the stories from their youth of, of the times. Uh, Paul Mukombo is one of our young guys who's down at Bible University right now in Kitwe. And uh, as a young believer in New Life Church, he would tell me of um, his brother's when they, their family had lost a, a large sum of money they had been saving in a roll of bills, and it, they lost it. They didn't know where it had gone. And so they were able to arrange for a spirit guide to come and to make contact with one of their ancestors. And, and they wanted to ask him if he could help them find their lost money. Ask me later, and I'll tell, tell you how that ended. But it it ended essentially with Paul becoming very afraid at, the, at what took place and, um, and seeking truth, and God found him, and God brought him to himself. Um, so there's, there is an emphasis on seeking guidance, seeking guidance for direction of how to live life, what to do tomorrow, what will, what will cause, uh, what will negate the bad things that will happen tomorrow. Um, it also places a heavy emphasis upon dreams for guidance, uh, as um, dreams as significant, as significant to guide us, and that has as having meaning, right? Um, and so, dreams are understood to be. Uh, communication from the spirit realm. Even if it can't be understood, there's a desire to parse and understand dreams. And my joke through the years has always been, how do I know? How do I know it's from God and not just a bad piece of pizza you had the night before, right? Um, and, uh, but many lines of thinking within ATR point to these kinds of things. It's even understood that when a person sleeps, his body dies and his mind travels to the spirit realm and learns things and comes back. And now they want to put those into practice in the physical realm. Um, And so there is a great emphasis that is placed upon recording dreams and interpreting them. Um, Within the church, um, these things continue to be a problem. Um, Unfortunately, there's very little uh, 
very little of the emphasis on external avenues of guidance changes when ATR is brought into the church. There continues to be, even in the church, an emphasis upon dreams and visions and prophecies and guidance by powerful men. Um, and the Bible is often used as a proof text uh, for the ways that God has worked in those kinds of fashions in the past. But sadly, very little emphasis is placed upon the actual study of God's word and the ultimate authority that God's word has to shape and inform the African Christian's perception and understanding of the physical realm and of the spiritual realm around them. So what happens when you have <laughs> very little emphasis upon the personal study of God's written word, okay? What happens when you have a God that is far away, add to that a man who is at the center of his universe with the spirit realm surrounding him to help him, and then surrounded by that powerful spirit realm that is being looked to as the hope and the culmination of everything you hope for. Well, what that often leads to is a very powerful and all-pervasive emphasis, not upon God, but upon Satan. In fact, when you visit many Christian churches, and I guess I would say Christian with air quotes, right? When you visit many churches in our city, um, the emphasis of their corporate gathering is not on God at all. It very much is upon Satan, right? What Satan is doing, what he's accomplishing, how they need to bind him, and that's praying against Satan, right? This emphasis is like Satan is just, that's all everyone is thinking about. It's not that they're worshiping Satan. I, I believe Satan receives a lot of glory from an emphasis like that. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, but they wouldn't say they're worshiping him. Don't get me wrong in that. They're so afraid of Satan and what their perception is of what he is doing that the entire emphasis of their corporate gathering is upon him. I can give an example of uh, many of the, the house churches or the the small tent gatherings that we find in our city, they'll oftentimes turn their loudspeakers out into the neighborhood. So I'm able to hear what's going on even without walking into their services. But a lot of times you'll hear the pastor praying on the loudspeaker. And first of all, he's praying according to the, the worldview of ATR. Right? I had a pastor in Zambia had to explain to me what we were seeing. I thought what we were seeing was just charismatic hermeneutic right? of, of this very big and boisterous idea of, of everything they do. But very much what we're seeing instead is the idea of African traditional religion where the man of, uh, of power, where the one who is going to be a mediator between the spirit in the physical realm, he has to present himself as very big and even more powerful than that spirit, or that spirit won't listen to him. And so when a man of power is communicating with the spirit realm, he's commanding, he's yelling, he's making himself forceful in order to bring that spirit under his control. Sadly, I see pastors in our city pray to God in that same fashion, as if somehow he is a mere spirit that can be controlled. And then as that man is praying to God, I assume, I mean, that's the assumption, right? That he's praying to Jehovah, the creator God. Then suddenly his, his wording shifts and you realize nothing in his demeanor has shifted, but he's not addressing God anymore. He's now addressing Satan. Directly, he's praying to Satan. Where are we instructed to address Satan in these ways? But he's praying to Satan now, binding him. This is all taking place within the corporate gathering of the church. Satan is viewed as the author and the fulfiller of many of the woes experienced in the life of the Congolese people. And much time is spent praying against Satan, seeking to identify what he is doing, and seeking to bind him in his effectiveness. And I truly, truly believe that Satan receives 
much glory through placing upon him the emphasis that only God deserves to have in our life and in our worship. So I'd like to further explore this sensitive dilemma um, if you come back this evening. We're not going to have enough time this morning to get into it, but I'd like to wrap up our time together this morning um, as we look at some of where the rubber meets the road, even with what Paul was telling the Athenians in Acts 17. I've been describing to you um, the predominant view of the region of Africa that we minister in. And one of my goals has been to give you uh, a window into the life of the people that we minister to on a daily basis, what they believe, how they think, what makes them tick, how they view the world around them. Uh, And I imagine that the average American's response to this description is, would be more like, wow, that's pretty crazy. That's a pretty crazy way (laughs) of viewing the world around you. We don't have any of those problems here in the West, do we? (laughs) It's interesting, though, that when Satan is in the details, um, there really isn't so much difference from culture to culture around the world as you visit different places, at least spiritually speaking, right? Um, When you compare America to Congo, what do you think the differences might be, spiritually speaking, right? I truly believe that if we were to pull aside the curtains that hide the activities of the spiritual realm in Africa and evaluate them, and then we were to do the same thing here in America and evaluate them, I believe that what we found there would be the same, right? And that the effect that Satan is having on both locations, <laughs> separated by an ocean, would be nearly identical. And what we would understand is that the means that he uses to accomplish his ends are slightly modified in each place, but the end result is the same, right, in each culture, because Satan knows exactly how to accomplish his goals in each of those different places, even though those two cultures have very different sensibilities. They have very different backgrounds. They have very different cultures. Tell me, what, what do you think the predominant view of God is in America? Right? I've been describing to you how the Congolese view God, right? By way of comparison, how... What is the predominant view of God in in America by way of comparison to the view of God in Congo? Do you feel that the uh, average American's view of God is that he is near or that he is far away? Uh, Wouldn't you say that many secular and academic Americans would argue that God even exists at all, right? How is that result any different from the idea that God is far away? The practical end result is very similar between those two mindsets, isn't it? What about the church? I wonder what the majority of American Christian sentiment has been during this past COVID lockdown period. All the craziness that we've been going through, right? Politically, economically, the economic crisis (laughs) that it caused and that we're still within uncertainty for the future that continues even to this day, right? Um, Many might try to surmise that Satan has been winning. Others might affirm that our hope lies in getting the right politicians into office, right? Or passing the right policies in order that things would get better, right? Is Satan winning? Can our hope truly truly lie in political, secular leaders? That's certainly not the truth that God's word teaches, is it? But for many, it can be more of a, a gut feeling of what is true, right? Whether the Bible teaches it or not, it very much becomes a part of our worldview, right? 
just like the Congolese have a way of viewing the world through lenses and interpreting everything through it, here in America, there is very much the same thing happening. There is a grid through which Americans filter everything that may or may not have anything to do with God's word at all. How is the idea that Satan is winning or that our hope is in man in any of its forms any different from God is far away? The end result is very much the same. Do you feel that the common sentiment in America and even the common sentiment in the churches in America has been that God is and that God has been fully in control all throughout these past two years of craziness all around the world. Would you say that that has been the predominant view even in the church in America? I guess my uh, even, well, to, if our answer to that question, if I can say it, if our answer to that question of God being fully in control, even despite all of the craziness that's been taking place, if our answer is not firmly rooted in a biblical understanding of God's sovereignty and his character of goodness and justice and righteousness and patience and wisdom, and we could go on, then if it's not grounded in those things, then our answer is less than helpful. And at its worst, it is dangerously close to the result that Satan ultimately wants. Right? So I guess my question this morning is whether or not you here in Delta, not just the Congolese people, know and understand the God who Paul was telling the Athenians about. Do you know this unknown God that Paul was describing to these people. Paul noticed that the Athenians were very religious. But that wasn't enough, was it? It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to have a Christian heritage, right? Even for generations, it's not enough. Many of the Congolese believe that since their culture has always taught about the creator God who created the physical realm and the spiritual realm, they believe that they have always had the truth about God long before Western missionaries brought the Bible. And that the Bible only elaborates on details that they already knew. It's not enough. It's not enough. I would counter that many Americans believe that since they have a Christian heritage, that they are also okay with God. But it's not enough. Congolese have an emphasis on dreams and visions and prophecies for guidance. But this isn't enough when you take God's authoritative word out of the picture, is it? I truly believe that Satan can manipulate all of those things when we depart from God's word, right? Um, What do Americans emphasize? What does this culture emphasize that is not enough? (laughs) You're going to have to help me with that. I've been out of this culture too long. I would need to do a deep dive again. I don't know if I would even want to do that at this point, but to be able to understand how the American mind ticks, you'll have to help me. But I see, just in the time that we've been here this uh, past few months, I see a lot of things emphasized in this culture that Americans find as their identity, right? They describe who they are as a person through these emphases in our culture that are far removed from what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. None of these things are enough. Do you know the unknown God that Paul introduces the Athenians to? This is who he is. And verse 24 of Acts 17, he is the God who made the world and everything in it, yes, Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Human hands can't 
serve his needs. He has no needs that we need to fulfill. He's not lacking anything that we provide for him. We don't serve him because he needs us to serve him. He's not completed somehow when we do that. He's not helped somehow when we serve him. He has no needs. Instead, we are the one who have needs, right? And he is the one who gives, Paul was telling the Athenians. He himself gives life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. And then verse 26, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. You'll have to decide what that beforehand means. Did it just mean before they rose and fell, he knew? Or before creation, before time? Yeah, I think that's probably closer to what it is, right? He knew, he, he didn't just know. That's the other thing. We, we often will insert that, I did it just now. He knew before things happened. That's not what our passage says, does it? It uses a much more precise word that means something far deeper. He didn't just know what would happen. He decided beforehand what would happen, who would rise and who would fall, and he determined their boundaries, verse 26 says. Verse 27 goes on and says, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God. And then it says at the end, he is not far from any one of us. Isn't it amazing that the great deceiver, everywhere he goes, he wants us to believe that God is far. But the message that God gives us is that he is near, right? Do we live our lives as if God is near? Do we assume that because of what is happening around us, he must be far? Do we live our lives as if God is in control? Or do we live them as if they depend on us somehow? As if our hopes lie with men, all right? The Congolese have men of power that they place their hopes within, these connecting points to the spiritual realm, right? They have the rainmaker. They have the witch doctor. They have the medicine man. Right? I think in America we have our politicians. Don't we? we place our hopes within. <laughs> it's not enough, is it? Um, our men of power. <laughs> A lot of these confusions stem from confusions surrounding the very description of God that Paul shared with the Athenians. And I'd like you to invite you back this evening as we continue to look at God's sovereignty, because really that is, that's the crux of the matter. He is sovereign. What does that mean? He is in control, yes, but he determines everything. One of the things that, um, that our church struggled with in Congo as we studied this topic of God's sovereignty over the 18 weeks of our lockdown period where we could only meet in small groups as a church. We had cell groups all over town, and we were all studying the same thing together through the leaders that I met with once a week to be within government boundaries of the lockdown. Um, we didn't have any access to um, Zoom or to technology and things like that. We had to be able to meet in person somehow, and we studied God's sovereignty. And what our members struggled with at first and then were challenged by and then were refreshed by by the end was the fact that God caused the coronavirus. And he did it according to his good plan. And if we can't wrestle with that and come out in the same description of God that he describes himself, that he decides who will rise and fall, and he determines our boundaries. If we can't agree with that, then we don't understand who God is, right? We have missed him somehow, right? Um, if we understand 
who God is and the way that he describes himself, we understand him then as the author of calamity and of destruction, not Satan. Satan doesn't deserve the glory that is due to God in those areas. But he's also the giver of life. And he's also the seat of all of our hopes, right? Um, we don't really need to talk about Satan at all. I feel like we've been talking about Satan too much this morning, right? We don't need to talk about Satan at all when we understand who God is. When we understand that God causes calamity, then we don't need to bind Satan to find relief. We go to the one who holds the answer in his hand, the one who has determined already the outcome. We don't need to talk about Satan at all. The Congolese church doesn't need to have a single emphasis upon Satan, right? Um, I can remember the, and I do need to watch the time here. Uh, I can remember as a, um, a youth, I had gotten a hold of the, the Frank Peretti books. I don't know if you'd ever read This Present Darkness and the idea that pulling back the curtain and seeing Satan at work. But the problem with those books was that you didn't know who was going to win, did you? Satan was working and God was fighting. His angels were fighting. But who was going to win? It makes an exciting story. But we already know who's going to win, right? The God who determined beforehand what will take place. I want to invite you back this evening. We're going to delve into the sovereignty of God some more, even as we continue to look at this passage in Acts 17. But allow me to pray with us now as we close out our time together. Father, we come before you. We love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you chose to reveal yourself to us, not just as our Savior, but as uh, all the details of your character that help us to understand the, the great and awesome God that we serve. And yes, you are not like us, but you created us in your likeness, nonetheless, that we would be able to have a relationship with you and to know you and to commune with you. And you communicated with us everything that we need for life and godliness. Our hope is not found on this earth. Our hope is not found in some perception of the spiritual realm that is outside of the boundaries that you describe. Our hope lies with you. We thank you that you see us and are pleased to draw us to yourself, to bring us into relationship with you through your son. We thank you for making a way that we could be made right with you. We thank you for giving us your only son to die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sins so that now we can be accepted into your family. We pray that you would go before us this afternoon, bring us back again this evening as we continue a look at your great character. We love you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.